Well, good morning. I'm Dick Oles. I'm the Dean of the UCR School of Medicine, and I'm your MC for today's uh, program. I want to welcome you all to uh, our uh, presentation from, from HARC, uh, a activity that I think is crucial for us as we plan to improve the health of our entire community. What's critical is to actually know precisely what your problems are and how we're doing and improving them. Now, I uh, today have the privilege of introducing first uh, the new interim dean of Cal State University San Bernardino's Palm Desert campus, uh, Dr. David Mayer. David. Well, it's a, another beautiful day to be in the Coachella Valley, and I'd like to welcome you all to the Cal State San Bernardino's Palm Desert campus. I hope you have a chance to kind of look around our campus. Uh, you have some really beautiful statues out there, and I'm going to point out two of them because it is important to you. One is the um, Freedom Stallion, which is a this magnificent, this magnificent sculpture outside. Uh, that horse was actually part of a display in, in, in uh, Berlin, Brandenburg Gate, when the Berlin Wall came down. And they casted five horses, and we ended up with one here. Also in the back lobby, there's a, a statue of George Montgomery, a, a local resident and a very famous 1920-1930 uh, cowboy uh, movie star. Now, I point this out. Uh, first, they are beautiful. And second, it is to remind you of the dress code. And the dress code is, you can bring your gun and wear your cowboy hats inside, but please leave your horse on the outside, okay? <laughs> so again, uh, we are really pleased to have Hark here. Very important, you know, a decision, uh, we tell our staff and our students that a decision is only good as the data you have to work off of. So thank you all for coming and have a great conference. Well, we have uh, many dignitaries uh, in the office, audience, and so it's my pleasure to introduce them. I would ask them each to stand, and I'd ask the audience to hold their applause until I have a chance to introduce all the dignitaries, uh, except for three that I'm going to introduce uh, individually because they're going to speak. So, uh, Linda Evans, a council member from Vaquita. Uh, Jimmy Boat, uh, a council member from uh, Palm Springs. Eduardo Garcia, a mayor of Coachella. Um, Aurora Wilson, trustee of the College of the Desert. Thank you all for, for being here. Now we have, we have three dignitaries that will speak for just a few minutes since we want to stay on time. And the first I'd like to introduce Dr. Raul Ruiz, the 36th Congressional District and a faculty member of the UCR School of Medicine. It's a pleasure to be here and welcome to everybody who's here. I just want to thank Hart and all the great work that they've done throughout the years to give us the evidence that we need in order to make evidence-based policy. The overall goal of today is to, is to, and all of our efforts, is to improve the health of, and wellness of not only our individual patients, but our community. And beyond the p-values, beyond the statistical significance, beyond the confidence intervals, beyond the standard deviations, what lie behind the statistical science are human lives. And these are the human faces of the people that we serve. We are not spreadsheets. We are not a confidence interval. We are people who need health care. People who struggle because they can't afford it. People who still lack the information that they need to make wise decisions. And that's what all of us in every one of our respective offices and departments are doing. So I want to thank you for keeping focused on the things that really matter. And I want to thank Clark for giving us the evidence to point us in the right directions to be the best servants that we can for the people that we serve. Thank you so much. I'd next like uh, to introduce Manuel Perez, our uh, assemblyman from the 56th district, and has been on both the Hart Board and the Honorary Board. Assemblyman. Thank you, Dr. Rose. Good morning to everyone. Buenos dias a todos que están aquí. It's definitely a pleasure uh, to be here with all of you, and I was told to keep it short. 
And so I will, but I just want to say that this feels like a high school reunion because I'm among many friends. I do remember when I was asked to become part of the board. I remember Gary Jinger and Aurora Wilson sitting down with me and talking about the potential of me being on the board. I remember the conversations that we had with uh, Mr. Glenn Raymond, our doctor, and Karen Sell, right, and Stephen Hernandez, and Fred Jant. When we were talking about the values and the vision and the mission and the core principles and what truly was going to be the purpose of heart. Was it going to be an activist oriented action research type of organization? Or was it going to be an organization that was going to provide data that was going to be objective so that our organizations throughout the Shell Valley can have the data they needed, the evidence, to ensure that we got the dollars that we deserve? You see, back then, in my opinion, we had to struggle quite a bit for our own fair share. And as a result of heart, I think that we've been able to move mountains. To the point now where the California Endowment Foundation, for example, the Wellness Foundation, for example, and other foundations are definitely investing in our own backyards. Where now we have the Humana Challenge. And now we have building healthy communities. To the point that we have Chelsea Clinton coming to Coachella for a community cleanup day. That was a purpose. And I was just so fortunate to be part of all that because I had mentors. I had mentors like Dr. Hare, when I worked with him in Santa Rosa del Valle. And I had mentors like Fred De Adam, when I worked with him for Santa Rosa del Valle as well as Borrego Community Health Foundation and which allowed me to become a board member of HEART. And quite frankly, at the end of the day, what, how I see this, this was a matter of equity. This was a matter of social justice. This was a matter of us being at the table at all levels of government, in our own communities, at a regional level, so that we can demonstrate to the folks that we also have needs. You see, growing up in the eastern Coachella Valley, the son of immigrant farm workers, not having health insurance, having to drive to Mexicali to go see a doctor or go see a dentist, I know what it's like. And many of you do as well. I know Dr. Raul Ruiz does as well. I know that my good friend Eduardo Garcia knows that as well. And I know many of you know that as well. But with that, let me just say we've come a long way. And it is true. It's about having the evidence so that we can ensure that we build policy from the ground up. And it's policy that's reflective of the needs of our community. And let me just say once again, I want to thank a few individuals, five individuals that are stuck with heart from the very beginning. Dr. Glenn Grayman, Aurora Wilson, Gary Jindren, I think he's here somewhere, Sarah Mack, and Eileen Patton. Thank you for all your great work. It's a pleasure being here. It's an honor. And last, I'd like to uh, introduce Dr. Uh, Mr. John Benoit, who's the 5th District uh, uh, Supervisor, who's been also on the Honorary uh, uh, Board of, of HARC and clearly a good friend of School of Medicine. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Olds, and uh, thank you all for being here. It's a, Great privilege for me to just say a couple of words of welcome to my good friends here. So many people I've known at so many different organizations from K-12 school time to high school, higher education, the, the, the dean and the old, uh, Dean Olds with the UCR, we work very closely together. And there are also many folks from the county uh, departments uh, who are here, uh, the folks who implement the safety net programs that are a lifeline to many in Riverside County. Uh, it's great to see this kind of uh, collaboration. And, and I've seen it over and over again in my 25 years in this valley. Uh, uh, we do things a little differently here because we're a community and, and it really shows. Uh, and it's important in that community to have the information that ARC pr provides. Uh, it has been very, very helpful. This is the third triennial survey provided. Uh, since the last survey, I'm told that the, more than 50 organizations have qualified for more than $4.7 million in grant funding for our valley. This is important data to have. The UCR Medical School certainly relied a lot on that in, in, in our efforts. Together, the county's 
$20 million contribution to bring that around. Uh, we are here uh, largely because we had the data uh, to back that need up. I understand that Bruce Yeager, the director of the Coachella Valley Volunteers in Medicine is here. Uh, there's, a, there's an organization where the county built the building and they, 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 they agreed to operate it. Why? Because there's a lot of folks that fall through the cracks and that's where they can go. He will tell you that if he didn't have the written uh, data, the data they used to write the grants, probably wouldn't be here. So we're very, very pleased to have ARC here and I'm proud to have been a small sponsor from the County of Riverside for this event today. Uh, and I encourage you to continue to keep up the good work. I, I know that your next report is going to have a special section on Desert Hot Springs. Uh, that's critically important. There's a, an area there that obviously needs a lot of attention in the area of service of our folks with uh, medical needs. So as a representative of all nine Coachella Valley cities and many diverse unincorporated communities, I look forward to hearing Dr. Graham's Martin remarks in the presentation today and the continuing good work that you do to help us meet the needs of this community. Thank you very much. Now I'd like to take this opportunity, we have up on the slide the members of the HARC board, uh, but again I would like a few of them that are in the audience just stand and please again hold your applause till I've introduced them all. I, I think that uh, the following people are in the audience, uh, David Brinkman, uh, Glenn Grayman, I know you're sitting right in front of me, John Mitch, Wayne Susie, I know you gave me this list, and Aurora Wilson. It's really the board that's one of the driving forces. Now, in addition to uh, the actual board, we have an honorary board that's very important for the advocacy for HARC. And interestingly, the three members that are here today, you've just met all three of them, so I'd, I'd again like to acknowledge uh, John Benoit, Manuel Perez, and Raul Ruiz, who are all members of the honorary board uh, of HARC. Thank you. So, it is now my pleasure to introduce one of the individuals already uh, mentioned by our speakers who has been with HARC from the very beginning and has really been one of the driving forces for this particular initiative. It's my pleasure uh, to introduce Eileen Packer, the CEO of HARC since its inception. Eileen. Thank you very much, Dino. I feel like being on the stage here that I should be doing a tap dance for you rather than telling you about Hart and um, uh, who we are and, and from whence we came. This is a monumental achievement for Hart. This is our third triennial survey and it has put us in a position to have data points that allow us to tell what changes have occurred here in the Coachella Valley and the health and the social well-being of our community. So at this point, one of the things I would like to acknowledge, too, is that um, if you'll take a look at the names that are here, I'm going to mention uh, who they are and as far as the uh, process of bringing the data to you today. We have today over 35 members who participate with HARP in developing our survey tool. Our community monitor, that is me. Every organization has a mission. The uh, mission is uh, the beginning. This is HARC as we are today. We are looking to provide the objective, reliable research and analysis and something else that we do. It's the technical services that we provide to the community. We do our own survey, but we do do surveys for others. But I'm going to take you back to the future. I'm going to take you back to uh, 2006 when HARC was founded. I'd like to give a shout out to uh, Wayne Susie and to the Desert Healthcare District, because it was their vision that HARC is here today. In 2006, as it says, the California Wellness Foundation did give a grant to the Desert Healthcare District to have a process that is data-driven to give information on the health of the community. Uh, Wayne and I got on the phone and we called these organizations, and I have to tell you, every one of them came to the table. Everyone was interested in having baseline data about our community. We brought the steering committee together, and there were three areas that were decided at that time. The first one was that we were going to do the random digit dial telephone survey. Number two, we were going to do it every three years. 
And then in order to do that, we had to uh, form a 501c3 because it takes a lot of money to do the survey. Our survey is, I look at it over a three year period, and the cost is $1.3 million for us to be able to do this and to be able to provide uh, the data back to the community, as, as the supervisor said, and as I'll show you later, the amount of uh, dollars that it has generated for our community. We've done the two previous triennial surveys in seven and 10, and our steering committee did participate in those, and as we are here in 2013, every three years we bring those 35 members together. We hand the past survey tool to them, and we take a look at it and say, okay, we need to decide what questions are gonna move forward, which ones are we going to add, and then which ones are we going to remove from uh, the survey. The survey, and you'll we'll show later, it's uh, 23 minutes long. Uh, we pay by the minute. So um, as you can imagine, if we were to increase the survey, it's going to increase the cost. So we work with the steering committee. We do break up into ad hoc teams. We bring in other uh, people in the uh, community, experts that, uh, such as mental health, <coughs> diabetes. We um, also, uh, children, uh, I see Harry Freeman is here from First Five. They come to the table and help us with the child survey and we work towards uh, developing a tool. This year we had 160 questions for the adults, and then we do another survey for the children, and we uh, ask a parent or a guardian whether um, they'll participate and answer the questions. While we were forming the steering committee, we sent out an RFP to uh, adjudicate the survey, and I knew the Department of Public Health, because we gave them the responses to the RFP, and they were the ones who helped us decide and to engage Kent State University. In essence of time, I was going to tell you a little bit about the methodology, but I think at this point, uh, we'll put it up on our website. And for those of you that are geeks and want to know about how we came about the numbers, um, and et cetera, how we based it on the, the science of a, a survey model, it'll be up there. We did do a sample size of 1,950 respondents for adults and 500 for children. One thing, and I'm sure a lot of you are thinking, well, what about the cell phones? This is a random digital telephone survey. Um, in 2010, we decided to do 9% of the surveys uh, for cell phone users only, and that was based on a conversation that I had with David Grant at UCLA for the just the California Health Interview Survey. At that point, they were doing about the same uh, numbers, but when we got to 2013, we know that there's more cell phone users. We increased that to 25%, so for this survey, 25, and they are what we call dual users. They um, have a landline and a cell phone, but they mainly use their cell phone. So we finalized the tool. The uh, Kent State was uh, in the field from January through June collecting the data. In the collection of the data after Kent State, collected the data, they weighted it. And again, that is based on the methodology. So if you go back and take a look, you'll uh, find out how we decided on which system to use to weight the data. The data was then um, given to us, the weighted data, in a software program called SPSS. It's an analytical software. It was brought to us in our Director of Research and Evaluation, Dr. General Account Heinle, analyzed the data and produced the executive report that you are going to receive after you leave here. Dr. Grayman is uh, going to give you highlights of uh, um, the results of that. After um, um, give you this report, we are going to be working and giving a report to Desert Hot Springs as uh, it was mentioned Desert Hot Springs has a health and wellness center, and they have oversampled in the survey so that they have baseline data, and then when we do this again in 2016, they will be able to measure and to understand what the differences have been, and then it'll take them to, to uh, 2019 to be where we are, where we can demonstrate to you uh, trends data. We have those three data points that we'll be able to show what the changes are. 
One thing that we haven't done before with the Desert Healthcare District, we've given them a written report, but this year uh, the Desert Healthcare District will have on Park Search, our online uh, database, all three years will be there and Desert Hot Springs will also be up. We are looking to uh, have our searchable database, which will have the information that is not in the executive report um, uh, up on uh, the uh, Heart Search uh, database. One of the things we decided when we did uh, start the process is that we knew that we were going to have all this valuable data. We didn't want it to sit on the shelf. So we did make a very concerted effort to reach out to the community to know about Heart to know about the, the data that was available. Every year we provide a training on how to use data, how to find data, logic model process, um, and evaluation process. So the process of trying to find out, okay, we've got the data, what about the community, how are you using it? Uh, since 2010, we have sent out uh, two surveys on our own to find out how people are using it and uh, what type of impact it's had on the community. Our first survey was $4.7 million into the community, and at this point, uh, the last one at $7.1 million. After Dr. Graydon's presentation, we have three wonderful uh, community members here that are going to tell you how we used HARP data and what kind of impact it had on their organization, and hopefully it'll help you uh, take our data and have it work for you in whatever mode that is going to suit your organization. But the other areas are strategic planning, programs, media articles, state OSHPOD requirements. Um, uh, there is a Senate Bill 697 since 1999. Eisenhower Hospital, which is a nonprofit, has been mandated to do a community benefit every three years. That's one of the reasons that we decided to do our survey every three years so that Eisenhower Hospital would have the data that they need for their community benefit reporting. Also, one of um, the things we're very, very proud for Desert AIDS Project, uh, we participated in their application for FGD and FQHC, provided the data, uh, they did the application, and that uh, was a very positive outcome, and we're very proud to be part of that, so we thank you on that. The up here is the collaboration of people. We at Heart, we are a mighty three. There's only three of us, and people say, how can you do that all? Well, it's because we have the support of others, the uh, people at Kent State University, the Department of Public Health helped us choose the, uh, the uh, company, the Kent State University, we did have uh, one of Dr. Reeves' future physician leaders intern, uh, Jonathan Lowe, who participated in the development of the executive report. So we were very, very happy to have him. But for me, it's an important our um, two staff members, uh, Dr. Jenna mccown Hydrate. <laughs> Jenna's been with Hart a very not even two years, and she has brought to our organization enthusiasm, her expertise, and her creativity. And I'm very, very grateful to have her as part of the team, and we wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for her and all of her hard work. And somewhere there, way at the back, is uh, Teresa Sanley. If you think of a needle and a thread, Teresa is the one that keeps us all together to make this happen. And then, you know, like people say, it's like at the Academy Awards, um, there's always somebody else to thank in your life who's helped you get to that. And uh, somewhere out there, and I think he's at the back, is Mr. Howard Packard. Howard and I have been married, <laughs> we've been married for 40 years, and um, this man has lived through these three surveys. <laughs> he'll, he'll tell you that he'll wake up in the middle of the night, and there I am at the computer, 3 o'clock in the morning, and he's not doing work. So. Thank you, Howard, for doing that. And also, at this point, I'd really like to thank the funders. As you heard, it takes a, a lot of money to do this survey, that $1.3 million. The Desert Healthcare District has been a major funder, and we're very, very appreciative of that. Um, and thank you to the district, and thank you to all of those that have helped us. 
Um, Alan Carter is here from the National Library of Medicine. Through a grant through the uh, Library of Medicine, they have funded this event. Uh, so thank you very much, Alan, for that. And also thank you to Sherman, because they're the ones that are responsible for the food. So I really, really appreciate it to them. Now, I know that you're all here not to hear me. You're all here to hear Dr. Grayman. And Dr. Grayman, if you would come up, please, because I just want to tell you um, a little bit about our president. Um, Glenn has been uh, with Park again from its inception. So we've, uh, we've been a traveling team. Uh, Glenn and I have gone about the, uh, the county um, of Riverside and even San Bernardino, doing presentations, telling people about Park, and without him also we would not be here. So I want to thank you. Thank you. Okay. Is this microphone working? Ah, yeah. oh, sounds like it is. <laughs> I am bound and determined to get you out of here on time. So I'm going to set my own timer here. One of my favorite quotes, and apropos to today's events, if you can't measure something, you can't understand it. If you can't understand it, you can't control it. You can't control it, you can't improve it. What we've done today and what we're going to be talking about during this uh, presentation is the measurements that HARC has done and is now releasing to you, our community. Our first goal in using those measurements, measurements is to help us all understand what's going on in the realm of health and wellness in the Coachella Valley. But our ultimate goal is for us to pull together and work to improve the deficiencies I'm going to be partially pointing out to you today. Eileen and others have mentioned already that this is our third triennial survey. Um, that makes a difference, as you're going to see. The three surveys have produced a huge amount of important information. And speaking of measurement, what they do is provide a quantitative way for us to understand past and current health care needs and quality of life issues here in the Coachella Valley. The three surveys now provide us with identifiable trends. And that's sort of the major difference of this discussion versus the one we did three years ago and the one we did six years ago on our two previous data releases. I'm going to tell you that uh, there are going to be some just the significant changes over time that I'm going to point out to you. And as a result, I'm going to be bringing you some good news, and I'm going to be bringing you some bad news, and I'm going to be telling you some stuff that, in my view, is just plain ugly. Now, most data presentations like this, the best we can hope for is to gain some interest from members of the audience and members of the community. But this time, I'm thinking that in addition, in addition to just interest, some of you may have a visceral response. There may be some emotions brought out today. I think some of you may be pleased with the results I'm going to show you, which is really just the tip of the iceberg of all the data we've collected and have available for you. Some of you are going to be pleased at some of these results based on what your particular interest is what your particular concerns are. Some of you, however, are not going to come out happy. Others of you may be upset with what I'm going to show you. And another group may just simply be incredulous. This can't be real. Well, all charts in the historical trends of this presentation and in the executive report you'll be receiving on your way out the door demonstrate statistically significant changes. Dr. Ruiz mentioned p-values, for those of you who are into that thing. All the differences in measurements that I'm going to point out to you today have p-values of less than 0.05. For those of you who are not into that sort of thing, what that really means is when I point out a significant difference, and I will call it that, what that means is there's a less than 5% likelihood and that difference in measurement is due to random variation or is somehow due to chance or perhaps is related to us doing 
a survey method which was just not correct. Conversely, greater than for the items that I point out are significant changes over time, there's a greater than 95% likelihood that those, difference, those differences are the real deal. That they're believable and you can take them to the bank. Four areas I'm going to talk about. Just briefly, what's the geography we're talking about? Then the survey focus areas were adults, seniors, 55 and up, and children, 0 to 17. Now, Many of you are not going to be happy with 55 and up as a definition of seniors. I get that. <laughs> I especially get that. <laughs> but there is a tool available to you on our website, I'll talk about it briefly here at the end, which allows you to dissect and pull out the demographic groups you're interested in. For example, you may be interested in a result of seniors between the ages of 65 and 75, and you may want to compare Latinos with whites, the tool is available for you to do that. Similarly, you may say First by Riverside is interested in those kids who are zero to five. You can on your own, they can on their own, with or without our help, dissect out just those kids in that age. In each of these survey focus areas, I'm going to be presenting a few results, pointing out the significant trends that I've already referenced. And then, very importantly, where do we go from here? I'm going to show you some of the evidence. What do we now do with it? The geography, here's sort of one map of the Coachella Valley broken into seven zones. What I want to point out is, is that this survey we only looked at the Coachella Valley per se. In the previous two surveys, we looked at the entirety of Eastern Riverside County, from Palo Mesa to Blythe, and then sort of pulled out the Coachella Valley. So we have a fair basis of comparison. This time, however, for a number of reasons, we only looked at the Coachella Valley. That is one difference between the survey and the other two. Let's look at a few results for adults. We're all acutely interested in health insurance, health care coverage. Let's talk briefly about that. Here's a slide showing the percent of adults 18 to 64, not Medicare age, 18 to 64, without health care coverage. In 2007, 22.5%. In 2010, 28.6%. Last year, 33.6% in the Coachella Valley. That is a significant increase from 2007. Now, there are some national trends that seem to be moving in that direction, but this is a marked increase. As a point value, if you compare this with this, that's about a 50% relative increase in uninsured adults. It's not entirely clear why that is such a radical change in the Coachella Valley. Unfortunately, I'm going to be saying that a number of times. We just don't know. I'm going to be sort of throwing out some hypotheses that we've come up with, but many of these things we're just not sure of the reasons. A couple of slides about chronic diseases in adults. Here's one. Percent of adults diagnosed with respiratory disease other than asthma. Now, check this. 2007, 3.6%. Last year, 9.2%. See, the incredulity is coming out already, right? That is a statistically significant increase from 2007. Now, what's that all about? Well, here's the second time I say, we are not sure. Now, a couple of hypotheses, but before I get to those, I just want to point out that there are opportunities here the students in this group, the medical residents that may be in this group, who are interested in doing a research project and are interested in that project being relevant to hometown, to the Coachella Valley, could delve into this. What are the subsets? What are the demographic groups which make up most of the changes, for example? What are the possible reasons and justify why those reasons might apply here in the Coachella Valley? But here's 
a couple of possibilities. We know that a couple of the important subgroups within chronic respiratory disease of adults other than asthma are COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, what some people refer to as emphysema and chronic bronchitis, and obstructive sleep apnea as two important subsets. Now, nationally, COPD prevalence rates is pretty stable. In fact, has been drifting somewhat downward in the last decade, probably related to less people smoking. But it is possible, I cannot say with certainty, there may be certain local allergens and air pollutants and dust, possibly related to the drying up of the Salton Sea, for example, which are leading to increased exacerbations, meaning respiratory distress, shortness of breath, cough, sputum production, in individuals not previously diagnosed as having COPD or respiratory disorder. And perhaps as a result of those diagnoses and therefore the prevalence in the Coachella Valley is increasing. One possibility. In the realm of obstructive sleep apnea, I don't know about you, but 10 years ago, I wasn't hearing much about that at all. In the last five years, I've been hearing a lot. Now, nationally, the diagnoses of obstructive sleep apnea, the prevalence has been increasing. Some people say related to increasing obesity and overweight in the adult population of the United States. We in the Coachella Valley may be merely mirroring that increase. Others will tell you that part of this is increased prevalence of sleep apnea it is due to the increasing attention paid by healthcare providers and sleep labs. My own son works in a sleep lab and the general public. Again, we're paying more attention to this, kind of a Hawthorne effect. People may be seeing their healthcare providers when they're having difficulty sleeping, when they're snoring loudly, etc. Maybe that's another thing that's changing to help account for that marked increase in respiratory disease here in the Coachella Valley. Let's switch to cancer. For set of adults diagnosed with cancer, ever having been diagnosed with cancer here at home, in 07, 9.6%, in 2013, 13.8%. That is a significant increase. And you'll notice that in the last subject and in this, there's no 2010 measurement. It's simply because we didn't ask the question in 2010. Well, why? <coughs> we know that nationally and globally, especially in highly developed countries, cancer prevalence is increasing. Maybe the Coachella Valley is simply following that trend. But this is a pretty substantial increase in cancer diagnoses in the last six years. Now, other than research possibilities, how else can this kind of data be used? Well, it's already been mentioned. Those of you involved in nonprofit organizations say as the Cancer Foundation, for example, or Gilda's Club, for example, who are dealing with patients here in the valley who've been diagnosed with cancer, can use this kind of evidence to say, we've got a problem, and that problem is increasing. We need additional funding to take care of those additional people who are being diagnosed with cancer, thus bringing in money to that organization and providing services to cancer patients they are not now receiving. Further, organizations like Desert Healthcare District, like certain funders and foundations and governmental entities, policymakers, can use this kind of data, and others I'm going to show you, others you're going to see in the executive report you'll receive, use this kind of data to change policy, to change asset allocation. If an organization, a funder, has a certain number of dollars they need to allocate over various problems, they may pay particular attention, for example, to this increase and say, we need to do something about it. We need to fund those nonprofits that can help. We need to bring money to the issue. Types of cancer diagnoses. Skin, probably not surprising to you, about a third of all the cancer diagnoses having been made of adult residents of Coachella Valley. Prostate and breast, the next two and then a series of smaller prevalence cancers, and then a lump group over here. Well, the 
could be said that one of the reasons, or it could be hypothesized that one of the reasons cancer diagnoses are going up is that we're just not screening well enough for precancerous lesions. Now that may be true, but it doesn't appear to be true in the realm of colorectal <coughs> cancer in the valley. Here is the percent of adults <coughs> age 50 and older that have never had in their lifetime a colonoscopy or sigmoidoscopy. Obviously, the shorter the bar, the better. Nationwide, that percentage is about a third of adults 50 and up have never had a single adoscopy or colonoscopy. In the state of California, about the same. In the Coachella Valley, significantly better than the state of California and the nation. So in terms of screening for colorectal cancer, we seem to be doing better than our colleagues elsewhere in these geographies. But that doesn't entirely hold for other screens. Percent of adult women never having had a pap test. 07, 9.5% were reasons we're not sure, dropped to 4.5, and then up to 9.6, a significant increase from here to here. In fact, in terms of point values, over a double relative increase. What are, what's that? Another way of looking at it, percent of adult women without a pap test in the last five years, 11.2 goes to 17.2, a significant increase. 17.2 goes to 20.4, Another statistically significant increase. Why? Again, all we bring to you today are certain hypotheses based on our review of the literature. One possibility is that certain important things happened in this interval between 2010 and 2013 that involved change of guidelines from important organizations. So, for example, the American Cancer Society guidelines for PAP frequency have lengthened progressively over time. It used to be, and those women here will probably remember, the recommendation was every single year you got a PAP smear. In 2009, the ACS changed this guideline and said, okay, if you're under 30, every two years is good enough. And if you're over 30, every three years is appropriate. Then, Two years ago, in 2012, the length was expanded further. Now, according to the American Cancer Society, every five years for women between the ages of 30 and 65 who also get an HPV test, which is negative. So, perhaps the fact that the interval between pap smears is increasing among women of Coachella Valley, maybe these women are just trying to follow the guidelines as best they understand them, or perhaps they're just confused as many of us are. Why should these guidelines be changing? I don't understand the science behind it, etc. I've already shown you that the uninsured rate has increased in the Coachella Valley. Maybe certain women simply can't afford to see a health care provider or don't have one at all, and therefore forego a pap smear, putting themselves at risk for cervical cancer later on. Switch gears. Bone disease. Percent of adults diagnosed with bone disease, including osteoporosis. 07, 6.4. Last year, 9.6. Again, a relative increase of about 50% in six years. Significant. Why? A couple of thoughts. Because osteoporosis, we did not ask the respondents, well, what kind of bone disease have you been diagnosed as having? And because we believe that osteoporosis is a big portion of those who responded, yes, I've been diagnosed as having bone disease, we know that the national prevalence of osteoporosis is increasing largely due, mainly due to the aging of the population. Mainly, Coachella Valley is just mirroring that change, that increased prevalence. Perhaps it's related to increased testing, and when osteoporosis is noted, increased treatment by healthcare providers here in the valley. 
And perhaps part of this is due to increased public awareness related to what the media is doing and what advertisers are doing. I see ads on television, not infrequently, of drug companies that manufacture medications used to treat osteoporosis. They're directly marketing to the consumer. That consumer then goes to his or her healthcare provider and says, measure me, check me, when they had never been checked before. Perhaps that's an effect. All right, different realm entirely, alcohol and smoking. This raised a lot of fuss three years ago and six years ago. And if you're paying attention, it should actually raise more of a fuss this time. 30% of adults in the Coachella Valley who drink, so an extrapolated number of people, 44,000 plus, 30% of adults who drink at all admit to binge drinking in the last month. What's binge drinking? CDC defines binge drinking as, on one occasion, a woman drinking four or more drinks or a man drinking five or more drinks. That's the definition of binge drinking that we're using. A third of all people who had at least one drink in the last month say they binge drank in the last month. I suspect the real number is substantially higher because these are the ones who admitted it to an unknown person on the other end of the telephone. <laughs> And if you think that's crazy, because I don't know how I would answer a question like, I know how I would answer this question, but I don't know how I would respond to an unknown person speaking to me on the phone. How are they going to use the information I give them kind of thing? And yet, 4% of adults, an estimated 9,560 adults in the Coachella Valley admit to driving in the past 30 days after having had too much to drink. So 4% of our adult respondents admitted to drunk driving in the last month. You think the real number may be higher than that? Yeah, I wouldn't be one to admit to that if I had. What that means is those of us sitting here today are darn lucky because we've all been driving on Coachella Valley streets alongside or facing at an intersection, this is 9,500 plus individuals, and we live to see today. This is a big deal. Smoking a little bit better. About 16% of adults report having smoked cigarettes every day or some days in the last year, but over half of them report having tried to quit at least once in the last year. All right, I'm not as worried about that. Let's look at alcohol a little bit more. Coachella Valley. Percent of adults having at least one drink of alcohol in the last month. One or more drinks. In the U.S., 55%. In the state of California, the same. In the Coachella Valley, 65%. Okay, so I saw that and I said, well, maybe it's because since we count in snowbirds, who spend a significant amount of time for a year in Coachella Valley, maybe those snowbirds are coming here to party, you know, to let their hair down, and maybe that's what's causing the drink. This is a vacation community, after all. All right, one thought. Let's go to the next one. Percent of drinkers, anyone who had at least one drink in the last month, who recorded binge drinking in the last month, in the U.S., this, in California, that, in the Coachella Valley. Really? Really? All right, so maybe they came here to really party. Okay. Overachievers. Overachievers. Overachieving drinkers. resort destination now for an excess of 50 years, if that were the cause, I wouldn't expect the frequency to be increasing in a short period of time, but it is. Here are binge drinkers, reported binge drinking in the past month, in 07, in 2010, bam. Again, 40 plus percent relative increase. Now, the scientists among you will say, hey, what are you talking about relative increases for? That's not to be trusted, and that is true, but I just want to point out these are substantial. 
So if it's because of people who come here to relax and put their hair down and drink, why would it be increasing so much in a short period of time? We simply don't know. Again, rife with research potential for those of you who uh, are interested in doing that kind of thing. We can help you get started. Now, I imagine there are some of you who are still somewhat hopeful, and others who are feeling some despair in what I've already presented, but nowhere do, does the intersection of those two emotions apply more than to mental health. Percent of adults with a mental health concern, 21.6, 18.2, 17.6. Significant increase from 2010. From that to that. Okay, still scratching my head over that one, but let's dissect down on that some. How about one mental health diagnosis? A phobia. 07, 2010, 2013, 1.7 to 4.7? Huh? Now, we know that stress nationally, if you ask people how much stress do you feel, that prevalence is going up nationally, workplace stress is going up. We have a number of low-income workers in the Coachella Valley. There's stress among them. But why this increase? Is it simply related to this national trend that we're seeing? Or might this be something specific and peculiar to the Coachella Valley? You've already noticed that I may be leaving you with more questions than you came in with. I consider that a good thing. I want you to think about this. I want you to have some feeling about this, not for the sake of thinking and feeling, but for the sake of us coming together to do something about it. That's why I'm here. All right, something we asked for the first time, medical marijuana usage. Turns out that approximately 8.3% of adults in the Coachella Valley are currently using marijuana for what they consider to be a medical purpose, such as these kinds of reasons. But even more interesting than that is that as a household income drops, the use of medical marijuana among adults in that household increases markedly. So that for households that are making a combined income of $75,000 or more, 5.5%, say 1 in 20 adults are using medical marijuana. But as you become poorer and poorer, if you will, and get to very low income households, it goes from 1 in 20 to greater than 1 in 6. Thus all the dispensaries fighting to get a license. <coughs> Seniors, I'm going to start off with a little good news, and I'm going to tell you a little bad news about seniors in the Coachella Valley. Good news. 15.7% of senior respondents reported living in households with incomes at or below 250% of the federal poverty guideline, these in yellow, and would therefore be likely eligible for some type of federal or state assistance. This group, 15.7%. Now, the converse is that 81.8% of seniors living in households that really don't have to deal day to day with issues of poverty or near poverty. 81.8%. The good news I want to tell you is that's getting better. That in 07, it was roughly 75% of our seniors who were at or above 300% of the federal poverty guideline. Then 69, these two are not statistically significantly different, but that is. By this measure, our seniors seem to be doing better financially. I'm really happy about that. Those of you from the Office on Aging are happy about that. Those of you from senior centers are happy about that. But what you're not going to be happy about is this. For some seniors who have experienced elder abuse in the last year, 2.9, 1.7, again, not a statistically significant difference between these two numbers. 
4.0. 1.7 goes to 4.0 in three years. Uh, the only consolation, partial consolation I can take is that nationally the percentage is about 10% of seniors get abused in the last, in a previous year. We are about in order to, treat, to achieve that. This is, physical or financial? this is physical and financial abuse. Children. Here I'm going to start off with some bad news and I'm going to end with some good news at the close. The bad news is over 79%, almost 80% of households with children had incomes at or below 250% of the federal poverty guideline and would therefore likely be eligible for some type of federal or state assistance. So you remember with seniors, it was 15.7% in that yellow band. Look at the yellow band now. Almost 80%. And it's getting worse. 2007, the percent of children in households at or below 100% of the federal poverty guideline, these are impoverished households. In the Coachella Valley, 28.2%, 32.8%, not a meaningful difference. And in three years, it's 48.7, which is meaningfully different from this and this. 32.8, 48.7, three years. Well, if we believe those economists, most economists will tell us that the recession ended about here, what's this all about? We all talk about, many of us talk about, income disparities increasing. The poor getting poorer, the rich getting richer, and the hollowing out of the middle class. Is this sort of a manifestation of that? I promised I would end this with some good news. Let's talk about childhood vaccinations. Percent of parents and guardians not at all concerned about potential risks associated with vaccinations. It was three years ago, four years ago now, 36%. Now it's 53.7%. In three years, that's a good thing. Now we still have a lot of educating to do, of the 46.3% of parents and guardians who are still really worried about vaccinations and the risks thereof, why might this be improving? Well, again, something happened in this interval. And that is, you may not recall the details, but many of you know that in the late 90s, 1998, there was now a very well-known and unfortunately very influential article published in the Lancet by Andrew Wakefield et al., which tied together MMR vaccinations and autism and inflammatory bowel disease in kids. In this interval, that article was debunked. Nobody could reproduce it. A lot of his co-authors came to the fore and said he had ulterior motives, maybe financial motives. Not only was that article declared fraudulent in 2011, he was banned from the practice of medicine in Britain for the rest of his life. That made lay headlines, and perhaps was somewhat influential on parents. Perhaps the educating many of us have done toward parents and guardians and adults in this room has made a difference. And we're hoping that this bar continues to increase over the next three years plus. But again, only if <laughs> we're able to do a survey like this, will we know? Lastly, pediatric mental health. I like this one a lot. Percent of children 3 to 17 with mental health problems as elucidated or as defined by their parents or guardians that have seen a family doctor or pediatrician for assessment and treatment in the last year. 2010, it was only 4%. 2013, a whole lot higher. Now that's a huge jump in three years. 
Why might that be? Well, certainly one possibility is that there seems to be an increasing national acceptance and there hopefully a local acceptance that mental illness is a valid health problem for children. And here's where I'm going to take a flyer, but I'm hoping that this is true. Many of you participated with us in the Coachella Valley Health Collaborative, led by Gary Jeandren, that spent years working to advocate for increased and improved mental health services in the Coachella Valley. Maybe we're seeing the positive effects of that now. Conclusions. We've got a whole lot more to share with you. This is, as I mentioned before, tip of the iceberg stuff. You'll be getting the executive report on your way out. Um, and you'll find in there that there's a number of topics that we've expanded upon and I've not mentioned at all. Things like more about health care coverage and utilization, a lot more about health screenings and preventative care, weight, activity, and nutrition. This is the first time I've said nothing about obesity in the Coachella Valley. Food insecurity and hunger, veterans issues. We now have singled out veterans. Dr. Ruiz, I know, is very interested in that. Social and economic, and many of you are as well. Social and economic needs, mental health concerns and treatment beyond the high points that I showed you. Suicide and suicidality, senior daily care, senior falls, and parental discussions with their children. We've got a wealth of information. This is a treasure trove that we're going to be mining for years to come, so-called data mining. There is so much that we can pull out, and we will be pulling out, in the form of special reports, which you'll be getting an email blast through the remainder of the year and into next. The report that you're going to receive today is more than 130 pages of additional findings. Our website will have that executive report up today as well, if you'd rather look for it there. Um, that is tabbed, it may be easier for you to find particular information if you use the executive report on the website rather than the paper version we're going to hand you. I mentioned at the beginning, you are able to do your own drill downs. You're able to do your own customized reports. We're happy to help you do this. We've created a tool called HeartSearch, which is now on our website, it has been there for some time which allows these customized reports, customized reports to be created by registered users. Now, it is currently free to register to become a user. Basically, we just need your email address to kind of know you exist and put you on our email blast list. It is free now, but given the difficulties that Park is having in adequately bringing in money, we may change that business model sometime in the future and charge something hopefully low to use this tool. 2007 and 2010 data is available now. We're going to be putting up this. We're still crunching this 2013 data. Month after next, it'll be up there. You'll be able to compare year over year. You'll be able to look at certain demographic groups, certain age groups, certain ethnicities, certain income categories, etc., and look at them side by side to see what the differences are. What we've done is just the first step in the process. Merely the beginning. The rest requires all of us working together. At least five groups, in my view, need to respond to this kind of data. The community as a whole, largely represented by this room. Nonprofit and proprietary organizations, again, largely represented here. Governmental entities, largely in the front row. Individual residents in our community, and I'm talking about benefactors and philanthropists, who need their help. And the Heart Collaborative, by which I mean our board, our steering committee, and those of you who've been working with us, including the Clinton Health Matters Initiative, led locally by Tricia Gerlai, all of us coming together to not let this stuff sit around for another three years, but to be doing something. What will we be doing in the meantime on our own? Further analyzing this data, issuing the bureaucratic reports I told you about, assuming that we can afford it, repeating the survey every three years with the changes in trends, we will continue to be a repository for data regarding health and well-being, 
And as we have been doing increasingly, doing customized studies, as commissioned by nonprofits, proprietary, and governmental organizations, as was mentioned, Desert Hot Springs will be doing, having their own special report. Indio has had their own special report in the past. The uh, gay and lesbian community has had their own special report through the LGBT Community Center. We are doing those special reports requested by clients now in Riverside County, and we now have some work to do in San Diego County. Geography is not an issue. We'll go anywhere. I want to thank you for your time and attention and remind you that we are open to your calls and communication through our website or by telephone call. Thanks so much. Well, in the planning of this particular uh, presentation today, uh, the board talked a lot about the fact that as important as data is, talking about data and getting data and the importance of data, you know, often lacks the human face of what the impact of data actually has. Now, as somebody that spent most of my professional career in other places besides California, I can tell you that there are very few, almost no communities in the United States that has access to population-based data that can actually tell communities what the real problems are there so that they can do something about it. This is a unique resource and it's something that we need to preserve because it puts our community in a particularly advantageous uh, position to do more about the problems that we have. To put more of a face on that, we've actually asked three other individuals from our community's uh, various programs to comment on the importance that data such as that produced today and outlined by uh, Dr. Grayman have had on their organizations, I think to have put a more complete face on the impact that HARC has on our community. I'm going to introduce all three, but they're going to come up sequentially. So uh, let me uh, introduce, our first speaker will be Linda Evans, who is the Director of the Business Development of JFK and uh, Desert Regional Medical Center Hospitals, is a council member of the city of La Quinta. Uh, Jenny Fote, who is Executive Director of Mazel Senior Center, County uh, member of the, uh, council member of the city of Palm Desert. And finally, uh, Pamela Gabore, who is the uh, director of the Institutional uh, Giving and Planning for Planned Parenthood of the Pacific Southwest, who will all comment on the importance that uh, Heart Data has had on their various organizations. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'm Linda Evans, and um, I've got a couple points to make. First of all, when I started at JFK, which is now 11 years in the desert, um, I often received calls from nonprofit organizations, many of them in the room, asking for information because they were submitting information for a grant. So they were going to the local hospital to say, how many pediatric patients did you treat with X? How many adults did you see that came in with Y? And we didn't always have the system in place to provide the exact information that was needed. So JFK was one of the original funders and adopters to embrace HARP when we heard about the opportunity to come together as an organization to have a single data source to say this is something that the entire community could use. So number one, we've been in with it since the beginning and Gary Hans, our CEO, who's a board member now, he's not, him and, Car uh, him and Carolyn Caldwell from Desert, they're at a meeting in, in Anaheim with the other CEOs of our company. Um, I know that they both recognize when they came to this area, this is an important component of what we do as a community hospital. Uh, so we, we jumped on board. So then it's how do we use this information? We're a for-profit company, so we're not out writing grants and asking for money. A little bit different than serving that community benefit need that Eisenhower does. So we utilize the data in a different way. We utilize it partially as an economic driver. Part of my role is recruiting physicians to the area. And while our company is able to offer some financial incentives to bring new doctors to the community, we have to have an outsourced, a third-party validation of a demonstrated community need for doctors specifically. And they look at the current population of physicians and that aging group of physicians, and we have some in this community that are retiring. Um, they look at the population growth of the community, and they look at the, the visit ratio based on each specialty. And then there's a, 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 either an overage or a deficit per specialty of physician. While that company provides that on an annual basis, we also dovetail that information with what HARC does to look at the specifics. Clearly, we have a deficit in every specialty 
in this community um, valley-wide. So we're not necessarily going to recruit physicians in every component. We're going to emphasize those key areas that will impact the community the best. So we combine the heart data with our outside company data to be able to put these packages together. And while that might help me justify bringing a doctor to the community, the other thing we do is we provide the physician, the potential physician coming to the area with the HARC survey. They are required to do their own due diligence to determine if this is the right area for them to practice. And it's not just a sales job to say, yes, we need more pediatricians, we need more ob we need more geriatricians. We're able to hand over a document that was prepared with quantifiable data that will be able to help support what that physician wants to do to bring his or her practice to our, our area. That's been a significant piece for us. The, the last piece would be the strategic component. Looking at what the data shows, how do we look at our strategic direction as a hospital and a community? We don't just treat the sick in all the hospitals, we have a responsibility to the community as well, which is why we're very much involved in the Clinton Health Initiatives, where we're involved in the Healthcare Collaborative, we have to look at areas of what's the right program to develop. Is it a diabetes program? It is a pediatric subspecialty program. I was just talking with Dr. Kim yesterday about the population expected growth for pediatrics. And when you look at the mental health component, we were talking about mood disorders. And why aren't we seeing that? Because it's out there. And, and what do we need to do to bring more physicians to the area to maybe to address those concerns? So we use that from a strategic direction as well. So, you know, again, not necessarily grant writing on my end. Um, if I put my city council hat on, La Quinta is a healthy, eating, active, living city. We embrace, Humana Challenge was mentioned earlier, we embrace having a healthy and active lifestyle. So we look at our population growth, our cultural diversity of our community, and we look at how do we provide avenues and means for people to stay healthy and address those needs of obesity, diabetes, heart disease, et cetera. So um, love heart, love the work that Eileen does, love your presentations, and I'm so glad to be able to share this with you and have all of you here this morning. Thank you. Um, I just want to say to anyone who's here from Palm Desert uh, that I did not run for your city council. I'm on the Palm Springs City Council. So. <laughs> um, and I'm Jenny Fote. Uh, and I, you know, this is, this is an exciting time, I think, because when, if, with my city council hat on, we do studies all the time. We, we do studies on everything you can possibly think to do studies on. And then what do we do with them? We put them on the shelf. And, and very few of those studies actually help anybody. And so when I put my executive director hat on from uh, my Zell Senior Center, it, it's a whole different thing. Because in the past that I've been doing nonprofit work for, for years and years, and in the past you used to be able to, to write a grant saying we, we really want to do this wonderful, wonderful work and we'll do it really well, and so give us money. And that used to be OK. Uh, but now we're in a very competitive kind of environment um, where there's an organization to take care of almost everything. Uh, and so we're, we're competing as nonprofits for very limited dollars. And they're even more limited if you're in the Coachella Valley. The percentage of money that comes from foundations and, and, and uh, other funding sources is very low compared to statistics from other areas of California. So we absolutely need the, the, uh, the data that's included in, in the HARC survey. Um, it also is very helpful if you are, this, this is coming towards me here and I'm going <laughs> to, it's also very helpful, <laughs> thank you. Um, if, you're, if you're looking at what, it, what is the problem and how can you prove that it's really a problem. Uh, and I know I, I brought my copy, which is all dog-eared, of last of the, of the 2010, and wanted to just make note of something. Um, we, uh, as an organization, my Zell Senior Center, we, we've, we started a couple of different programs. We, last year we served 120,000 meals, uh, lunches, to seniors in the Coachella Valley. Um, and we only did that and only got that grant to be able to do that because of the data that was included in the HARC report. 
because of the of the poverty level of some of our seniors, especially the East Valley, we had no way of quantifying that or proving it without the HARC data. We are now, we've just started another program which is a um, fall prevention program. Uh, because if seniors, seniors have such a fear of falling that a lot of seniors don't leave their home. Uh, and senior issues are not a really popular thing. You, you saw when uh, Dr. Grayson came up and we kind of all laughed about being a senior. Uh, and admitting you're a senior. Uh, so it's not a sexy cause. There are a lot of sexy causes, you know, that everybody wants to get on board, but seniors are not. You have to admit almost to your own mortality by admitting that, you, that you're a senior. So there's a, right here in the book where I have it marked, there's a key finding about, about falling and about how seniors are afraid of falling. Those are the kind of statistics that we have um, put in our grants. And we couldn't have done this without HARC. We, we've got hundreds of thousands of dollars. Our grant uh, from the county office on aging had a lot of HARC statistics in it. We have our fall prevention program has a lot of HARC statistics. So this is not a, a study that's ever going to go on the shelf and not be looked at. It's very valuable. It's valuable to me as a um, as a council member uh, in looking at what's happening in my city uh, with the seniors. And our, our, our area has such a uh, reputation that seniors come here uh, wealthy to, uh, to retire in the Coachella Valley. And there's such a different picture out there. And when you read the study and you saw what Dr. Grayson put up there, uh, it, it's, it's really true. So I want to thank Hark. Thank you for all the work that you've done. Uh, it makes my job easier. Uh, it's helped us bring dollars into the Coachella Valley to take care of our seniors. Uh, and, and so thank you very much. And I look forward to looking at the new data. Uh, my name is Pamela Gabery. I'm the Director of Institutional Giving at Planned Parenthood, uh, which means I'm a member of our fundraising team, and essentially most of my responsibilities fall under the area of grant writing. Um, first of all, I want to thank Dean Olds, uh, Dr. Maynard, the university, the Hart Board and staff, elected officials in attendance, and all of you who really serve and support this community, um, and it's a great opportunity to be able to talk about how Hark data has really made an impact on our agency's fundraising activities. Um, as you probably know, grant writing can be complex and even intimidating. Um, how do you convince a foundation, an individual, a government agency, that not only is there a need in your community, but that your organization is the best one to provide that solution? Um, we just provide them with an argument they can't refuse, right? Easy. Um, but what I found successful, and I'm sure most of you have as well, is not only to prevent Prevent, so I present funders with compelling stories, but with exceptional data. The stories, well, at Planned Parenthood, we're really lucky with that. Our patients tell us all the time how our services and programs have impacted their lives for the better. But the data, searching for data, can be really time consuming. Um, there are a lot of sources I use on a near daily basis. Uh, the US Census, US Department of Health and Human Services, the Guttmacher Institute, the CDC. But here in the Coachella Valley, um, community, I always use HARC um, for their great data, for the evidence, and to help me persuade funders. Um, what I think, and, and what I think some of our funders agree with, is that being able to compare this local regional data with the uh, significant trends and changes um, in other regions, in the state, nationally, it really provides the re relevance, the clarity, the detail, the specificity, and the perspective to say with confidence why this? Why here? Why now? And why us? For example, when our agency applied for the California Personal Responsibility Education Program in 2012 to engage in teen pregnancy prevention efforts through evidence-based programming here in Riverside County, I had a wide range of teen pregnancy statistics to look at. But none of these sources were able to tell me that more than half of parents and guardians in the Coachella Valley had not talked to their child 
about sexual issues or pregnancy. And believe it or not, the research says that kids want to hear this from their parents first. Uh, but Hark was able to provide this extra element that really demonstrated local need and the relevance for our work in this community. So I'm happy to report that the California Department of Public Health awarded Planned Parenthood $1.7 million to engage in these efforts. It's the largest grant of its kind that we've ever secured. And because of this, we're working with youth in juvenile hall, in foster care, after school programs, substance abuse treatment centers, and other places that are hotspots for sexually transmitted infections and teen pregnancy. Got a little more, if that's okay. <laughs> Not only have we been able to leverage funds, uh, but this kind of regional data really helps us know that we're on a strategic path to where we need and where we need to target our services. For example, like I said, we know what the rates of sexually transmitted infections are, but knowing that 83% of Coachella Valley residents have not received information from a healthcare professional about the prevention of STIs through con condom use, or that 53% of 18 to 64 year olds, that's about 107,000 Coachella Valley residents, reported that they have not been tested for HIV. These are both HARP statistics, if you haven't guessed that already. Um, this lets us know that our work here is not only necessary, but that we've got a lot of work to do. Uh, HARP data helps us guide where we need to be in the community. In addition to our two health centers in Rancho Mirage and Coachella, which collectively see about 27,000 patients visit, visits annually, we're engaged in the community. We're, we're actively striving to listen to all of you who, who help us know what we can do better. Some of this includes helping everyone in the community know their HIV status by partnering with Get Tested Coachella Valley, offering our services to College of the Desert students on their very own campus. Our promotoras go to the agricultural fields, they go to door to door, and they go to other places where residents live, work, shop, and play to make sure they know how and where they can take care of their reproductive health. We're working with the local CalSafe program and the RAP Foundation to help teen moms get on a path to success and we're just about to launch a new Latina Leadership Academy that's going to help empower young Latinas to be ambassadors in their community uh, in partnership with the California Endowment. Uh, lastly, we're working with several other nonprofits, the California Endowment and the Desert Healthcare District, to help enroll this community's uninsured residents into health coverage as well as connect them to care. So it's clear for us that HARP Data tells the story of how together we can and, and we will change people's lives. So thanks, Hark. Well, thank you. I think the, the message is, you know, Hark is not only a valuable organization in and of itself, but it's an absolutely critical and vital community resource that helps many good things happen in this community. Let me also apologize for Ginny. I almost made it through the entire thing without screwing up somebody's name or title, but uh, at least you're done by 10 o'clock. So, uh, so let me uh, point out that uh, you can have your hard copy of the executive data on the way out. Uh, it'll be up on the website in about a month. I want to thank uh, uh, Cal State uh, Palm Desert Campus for what a, what a wonderful facility for, uh, for this uh, morning's events. I want to thank you all for coming. Uh, this is why this is a great community because we have so many people interested in making it better. Have a wonderful morning and thanks for coming.